Oh, I should just acknowledge before I move on. Uh, Tim Dalport's actually a, a, a very active uh, undergraduate student, and he's uh, functioning it easily at the, the level of a postgraduate student. And Stuart Whitten is one of our industry uh, collaborators. Uh, just a little bit on, uh, this is coal mining. So we're not talking about uh, uh, oil sands tailings in this talk. Coal mining in Australia is progressing west, and I'll show you a couple of maps in a moment just to show you that. And as we go west, we're going into clay-rich materials, clay-rich interburdens between the coal seams and also the overburdens. And as a result of that, we end up with potentially clay-rich tailings as well. And they exhibit poor settling and dewatering behaviour. Um, I would argue in some cases worse than the, the ore sands. But we're in a different climate, so perhaps that helps. And in a, an effort to better understand these, because they're comprised of a range of clays, not just a, a single clay, the idea was to test some commercial clays to get an idea of how, you know, more or less pure bentonites or pure kaolinites behaved, and then to start looking at, use that information to start looking at the, the coal tailings themselves. So just to indicate um, the two areas that I'm talking about, Queensland on the left, on your left, and New South Wales on the right. So they're the two coal basins. And the direction we're moving in, in the case of Queensland, we're moving west into the Surratt Basin, almost due west of, of Brisbane. And we're moving from the Bowen Basin into the Galilee Basin, also due west. And in the case of New South Wales, we're moving from originally the Newcastle region into the, the Upper Hunter and then eventually in, into the Gunnedah uh, region. Um, and I think, I think people lose sight of the fact that just how quickly we are exploiting uh, some of our best resources. So if you think of just New South Wales as an example, if you go back 30 or 40 years, the centre of coal mining in New South Wales was Newcastle on the coast. So Newcastle's there. And then about, um, it's about an hour's drive to Singleton, and Singleton was the centre of coal mining activity in New South Wales perhaps about 15 years ago. And it's currently Musselbrook, which is here. So we're rapidly moving west uh, because we're depleting the, the coal fields as we go. So the focus of the presentation really is to look at uh, researching and managing these clay rich, uh, potentially clay rich coal mine tailings. And you really need to look at them on two scales. So it turns out that I'm a soil mechanics practitioner and soil mechanics is not enough. Uh, we can do our soil mechanics type tests. We can do things like the macro tests of settling, we can look at filtration, we can look at consolidation. We can look at desiccation and loading when you put a cap on the top. Um, and a lot of those are actually quite difficult because often these tailings don't get to a state where you can actually do those geotechnical tests. You can do settling, but if they don't settle enough to get soil-like enough, you can't do the consolidation and, and strength testing anyway. But we need to look also at the micro behaviour, the clay mineral interactions, mineral interactions with water, uh, the metal salts, coagulants, flocculants, um, all of those constitute really soil science. So we need a, a combination of disciplines, not just to your technical, we need to look at the soil science as well. Now in the paper I'm going to talk about, I'll focus on settling, the settling part of the macro behaviour, because that's the bit that it can actually do. And we'll, we'll show that uh, the water used is, is a, a very strong uh, indicator of how the settling might occur. And we'll also look at adding metal salts. Uh, problematic clays uh, found in clay-rich coal mine tailings can range from midnight right through to uh, kaolin dominated. Uh, I'm not going to focus too much on this. We had uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six commercial clays that we looked at. They ranged from sodium and calcium midnight through to kaolinite. And we had two uh, coal mine, well in this paper anyway, I'll talk about just two coal mine tailings. One from Queensland, one from New South Wales, just to be diplomatic. And we looked at, in the case of the, the coal mine tailings, we looked just, not just at the tailings that were produced, but also at the run of mine. So the run of mine material from which the tailings derive once you wash the coal, run of mine coal, wash to produce coal, but also tailings as a byproduct, the run of mine is different from the tailings. And if we wanted to look at how the run of mine uh, might behave in terms of its, the tailings that are produced, we don't just look at the tailings we've produced because they've already been altered by whatever processing was done. So we need to look at the raw material as well. Um, now again, I don't want to concentrate too much on this. I just want to highlight the fact that uh, most of the commercial clays are bentonite dominant and one of them is kaolinite dominant. But also look at how high the bentonite concentration is in the two samples of 
the coal tailings we're looking at. Uh, I'd argue much worse than the oil sands tailings. Now, just uh, looking at the, I'm a soil mechanics person, so we look at uh, liquid limit, plastic limit, plasticity index for what that might mean and come up with a universal uh, uh, unified soil classification. So you can see that uh, the commercial clays are all CH apart from this one and this one, which is an intermediate, that's the kaolinite. And the two uh, coal mine tailings, intermediate clay and a high plasticity clay. Notice also the SGs. So the SGs are quite low for the commercial clays, but they're even lower for the tailings because they have some, dare I say, coal material in them. Uh, a lot of the miners prefer to <laughs> refer to it as uh, of carbonaceous shale rather than coal because they don't want to admit that they're actually chucking away coal with their tailings. So here we've got some particle size distributions for the run of mine and the underflow. So if we look just at the orange curves, you can see there's a bit of a difference between the two. So that's the raw material, the raw feed that goes into the plant, and this is what comes out of the plant. And you'll notice there's a crossover point. But the crossover point is uh, the reason for that is uh, uh, the breakdown of material that occurs, because these materials are quite prone to breakdown. So it's the breakdown of the material that occurs in the plant, and the reason for the crossover is the, the effect of flocculants. And the same occurs for the green, not quite so dramatic. So breakdown of material and the crossover is due to flocculation. Just to give you an idea of the particle size distribution. Just a bit of the, the, the chemistry of the water samples, and I'm not an expert on chemistry, but, and I won't dwell on it too much. But I guess uh, one of the things you can focus on is the electrical conductivity. And notice one of the samples we use is alum, which is not traditionally used as a flocculant in, or a metal salt in the coal mine industry, but it is used a lot in sewage treatment. And it turns out that alum is one of the, of the metal salts we use, it's one of the best. <laughs> but it's typically not used. But look at the ECs, um, look at the simulated processed water plus metal salts. And the ECs there, and this one by far, this is the water only, it's actually got the highest uh, EC. And moving on, settling column test. So it's a very simple test. It's a bit like taking a, a column within the, the tailings and seeing how that settles out. The trouble is that you've got the wall effect. So uh, depending on the uh, volume to surface area, internal surface area ratio of your test, you'll get a different answer. So if you imagine tailings is typically quite broad, and if you take a little column in the middle, it doesn't know the walls are even there. So it's not affected by the walls. So sedimentation is, is in fact slowed, uh, sorry, speeded up by the fact that you've got the walls there because you get water flow along the sides. But once you start forming a sediment at the bottom, the sediment develops shear on the sides of the wall and slows it up. So in the base of your settling column test, where you've got sediment, the consolidation process where it's becoming soil-like is slowed up, but in the upper part where you've got suspended solids, it's speeded up. Notice also that some of them form quite a nice clarified water on the top, uh, some of them don't. And if you had a situation like this, you'd probably try and record two levels, that level and the level, um, wherever that, that is, that's as easy here, that level there, we've got clear water above. The, uh, the different percent solids we started with, 5, 10, 20 percent solids by mass. So we're starting from, we're being very unoptimistic, but in fact that was realistic because if you made it much more than that percent solids, it didn't settle at all. Uh, we mechanically stirred them, we inverted them, uh, we recorded the, the some subsequent levels at different time intervals for a total of 72 hours. And we calculated and plotted the percent solids versus the time, not just the settlement, but what people wanted was percent solid. So uh, here's, uh, here's a plot of, this is the settling of the commercial clays in either deionised water or processed water. It turns out the deionised water is not salt free. You'd have to go to a very purified distilled water to get salt free. And it's not very realistic anyway, but it acted as a, as a control. So the, the thing to notice here is that one of the samples, which is uh, still one of the benzonites, if you look, this is a plot of initial solids concentration versus final, and you can see that the final solids con concentration in this case was, a much was much higher than the initial, the one-to-one -one line. Um, two other samples did quite well too, but the others just plotted along this line. So in other words, they did nothing. They just sat there. Whatever percent solids you put them in at, they stayed at that percent solids. That's the ionised water, and this is the simulated process water. It doesn't necessarily help. So if you look at this sample here, 
it uh, ended up about the same, but it didn't perform as well when you put it in at lower percent solids. Um, these two performed slightly better. Um, a couple of these lifted off the one-to-one -one line, but they didn't perform much better. So changing the, the salts in the process water, um, or going between deionized and process water, didn't help all that much. And you can't read all of that, uh, but it's just describing which ones settled best and which ones didn't. Now if you look at the commercial clays in deionized water plus uh, an equivalent ionic concentration of each of the metals, now, uh, just have a look at this. <laughs> uh, pretty pathetic behaviour. So some of them, these are the final percent solids, some of them did nothing at all. If you look at uh, COM0101, did nothing at all. Whatever percent solids you put it in at, it stayed at that percent solid. Um, and some of them did slightly better, but uh, the best we've achieved is something approaching 35% solids, which is uh, a little disappointing. I should say, by the way, that there are actually very few mines that are operating in, in these regions that we're talking about. Uh, the few that, that do operate are fairly small, and they take two, one of two different approaches. Uh, one approach is that you try to avoid the, the clay-rich materials going into the plant. So you simply concentrate on the, uh, on the uh, run of mine ore that does not contain clay seams, for example, or that is thick enough that you can uh, dilute the clay seams so they don't have a major effect. The other approach is to try and take everything, and the end result of that is that you bog the wash plant end up with all sorts of problems. So the summary from that is that the, the first one didn't settle at all, even with the addition of metal salts, although alum had a, a slightly minor uh, beneficial effect. The second one showed some enhanced settling with the addition of two salts in particular, calcium chloride and magnesium chloride. Um, the third one showed substantially improved settling. The fourth one, COM3, settled the best and again most well in deionized water alone, so it didn't actually help adding metal salts at all. The fourth one didn't settle, and the fifth one, which is kaolinite, settled the second best in all cases, with the best being magnesium chloride. Now again, this is uh, settling from 5% solids uh, plus equivalent metal salts. And again, you can see rather disappointing uh, behaviour. We're still talking about the commercial clays, but this time in process water rather than deionized. And you can see again that first one does very little and the best you're achieving here is a bit over 25%. We're talking about commercial clays here but wait until we see the, the um, uh, coal tailings because they be behave pretty much the same. So this is uh, summarised by the first one settles um, slightly better with the addition of calcium chloride. So it's all over the place. It, uh, it, there's no consistent trend for particular salts being added. There's no consistent trend going from deionized water to simulated process water. The second one was uh, improved slightly with the, the addition of metal salts, particularly alum. Uh, the third one was uh, the settling was reasonable in process water and largely unaffected by the addition of metal salts. The next one settled was uh, settled reasonably, but was improved best with alum or perhaps magnesium chloride. The, the next one did not settle at all. And uh, the last one, kaolinite, settled uh, generally the best, largely irrespective of the metal salts that were added. Overall, alum probably performed the best, but only marginally. So this is now looking at uh, the settling of, we just picked one of the, the clays, COM3, one in the middle, it's a bentonite. And we looked at, looking at um, de uh, processed water, deionized water, and uh, 0.1 molar of metal salts. And you can see in this case, where we've, this time we've made the metal salts not equivalent ionic concentration, but we've made them all the same molar concentration. And all of them lift off the one-to-one -one line in this case. So um, these are different equivalent ionic concentrations, but the same molar concentrations, they all have some beneficial effect. So focusing on the best performing of the commercial clays, the kaolinite, um, COM5 slurries at lower percent solids settled relatively more than slurries at higher percent solids. Uh, so there's no advantage in putting it out at higher percent solids if you're just looking at settling. Suggesting the water recovery is not necessarily improved by increasing the initial percent solids. And of the metal salts tested for this middle ranking best performing clay, uh, sorry, the kaolinite clay, calcium sulphate improved settling the most. 
Okay, now we'll look at uh, what if we, rather than just looking at changing or keeping the, the molar concentration constant, we'll look at one times uh, equivalent ionic concentration, five times and then ten times. What impact does that have? And you can see, not very much. So we're looking at one times, five times, ten times. In some cases it even goes backwards. But a, a great increase in metal salts doesn't necessarily help all that much. And again, um, the best we're getting is somewhere between 20 and 25 percent final uh, percent solids. So again, now focusing on the average performing commercial play COM2, uh, this, this one I've just shown you, there was some improvement in settling with increasing equivalent ionic concentration up to a certain metal salt concentration, then it tended to either level off or even get worse. For sodium chloride, the best settling was achieved at a single equivalent ionic concentration, not increasing it to five or ten times. The highest we got was somewhere between 22 and 23. Now we're still dealing just with the commercial clays because we're trying to get some benchmarking here. Now we're looking at the, the actual um, simulated clay tailings derived from the, the ROM samples. So this is the one from the Surat, and you can see that it doesn't behave much better than the commercial clay. And we've looked here at uh, one, five, and ten times equivalent ionic concentration. In the case of if that concentration is sodium chloride, uh, effectively no increase, no, no benefit. Some benefit here, a little bit there, and so on. Alum seems to benefit most when you get up to five, but when you add it up to ten times the equivalent ionic concentration, it makes it worse again. So not very encouraging behaviour. So just focusing on that particular one from the Queensland Surat Basin, in general, there is some improvement in settling with increasing equivalent ionic concentration of salts up to a certain metal salt concentration. Uh, NACL performed the worst. Uh, the highest we got to was about 26.5% final percent solids with magnesium chloride, followed by alum and calcium chloride at about 24.5%. Now looking at the Hunter Valley one, and a similar sort of story. Uh, slight increase with NACL, some improvement in the other ones. Again, alum was actually best if you don't add too much. So quite sensitive all over the place, very hard to interpret. But the behaviour of the, the two coal tailing samples is not much better, in some cases worse, than some of the commercial clays. Gives you an indication just how bad they are. So some improvement in settling with increasing equivalent ionic concentration, again up to a certain level. The best was 24.5% for magnesium chloride and calcium chloride. So conclusions, results highlight the complexity of the settling behaviour of slurries of commercial, both commercial clays and typical clay-rich coal mine tailings. We were hoping to get uh, a better clarity, sense of clarity about how the um, coal mine tailings would perform by looking at constitutive clays, but it didn't really help all that much because it's so complex. So there's a very complex interaction at the micro scale that a soil mechanics, a mere soil mechanics expert, uh, can't hope to, to fathom. Increasing the concentration of the metal salts generally improved the settling with increasing equivalent ionic concentration up to a certain concentration that varied with the clays and varied with the metal salts. It's clear that the slurries of commercial bentonite clays are unlikely to settle under their self-weight alone to better than about 30% solids at the best. And even kaolinite is unlikely to settle to better than 35% solids regardless of the metal salts that are added. Slurries of clay-rich coal mine tailings settled uh, to no, no better than about 25% solids, so worse than the commercial clays. Uh, that implies 75% mass at, or, or at uh, least 85% um, solids by volume is entrained water. Uh, if you operate a mine where you're entraining that degree of water, particularly in Australia's sort of uh, arid climate, you'll simply run out of water, if not storage uh, space for your tailings. And lastly, acknowledgements. Uh, the research on which the paper is based is part of an ACARP uh, project, Australian Coal Association Research Program. The samples were provided by commercial clay suppliers and participating coal mine sites. Um, assistance uh, with the testing was provided by a number of uh, undergraduate students who are listed there.